Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day and for this place to which you bring us and for this opportunity to open your word. Now be with us, Lord. Speak to us. We want Jesus to be Lord of our lives. In his name we pray. Amen. So there's a danger that happens to someone when they're demonstrating authority. And this, this happened in the case of Jesus in a, in a very profound way. And the story we're going to look at today is, is, is what happens in that context. But I want to remind you before we get to it of, of the, some of the things we've been talking about in the previous weeks. So Mark's gospel, he sets out to establish that Jesus is the authority. And he uses a specific word for authority. He uses the word exousion. Now that's a Greek word, exousion, that means not just authority but also power. It's actually interpreted both ways in different passages that we've looked at so far in this series. But basically what exousion means is not just a pretend authority but someone who has exousion can say it and make it happen. So you know those people in your life, the ones who say something and make it happen. There's a lot of people who say stuff, but they don't have the authority to actually do it. Well, Jesus had the authority to do what he said. And the word for that is exousion. And and so we've seen Mark establishing the authority of Jesus. And he's established that Jesus has authority in a number of areas. The first one that he establishes, Jesus has the authority to call. It says Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee and he saw Andrew and Peter and James and John and he turned to them and said, follow me. And there was something in the way he said that, something in the authority in him that caused them to leave behind the profession that they had used to survive their whole lives and follow after Jesus. And I've suggested to you before that that authority and the call of Jesus still exists today because you have heard Jesus call as well. And maybe you didn't walk away from your profession, but you walked away from a way of life to a new way of life in Jesus. That's the authority to call. But then after that, the Bible says in the book of Mark that he went into the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching, it says, because he taught as one with exousion. He taught as one with authority. So the second thing we learned is Jesus has authority to teach. The third thing, on that same encounter in the synagogue, a man stood up, possessed by a demon, and the demon said, we know who you are, son of the most high God. Have you come to torture us before our time? And Jesus said, be quiet, come out of him. And the demon left him. And from that we learn Jesus has authority over demons. After this, he goes to the home of Peter, and Peter's mother-in-law is there, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick. He takes her hand, lifts her up. The disease goes from her, and from that story we learn Jesus has authority over disease. Now, all four of these authorities Jesus demonstrates. All four of these come as a reality of who Jesus is. He is the one who calls. He is the one who teaches because he knows. He has authority over demons because he's over them. He has authority over disease because instead of uncleanness getting on him, when you touch Jesus, the cleanness of Jesus gets in you. He cleanses you. That's how it works. But then last Sabbath, we talked about a specific authority that Jesus claimed. And it happened when the paralytic was let down before him and he looked at the man and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus claims the authority to forgive sins. Now, this was a powerful moment because it is a promise he's making him because at the point of the promise, Jesus has not yet secured the authority. He will secure that authority by living out his life, by dying on the cross, and by rising again. So it is through this great work of Jesus that he gains authority to forgive our sins. Well, we're going to talk about a couple other authorities that Jesus is going to claim. And he's going to claim them today. If we were to go on in chapter 2, we would encounter another story of Jesus making a call. He calls Matthew the tax collector who walks away from his profession to follow Jesus. We see that authority again. But then we get two more stories. And these two stories are going to set up 
the key story today, which takes place in chapter 3. But the first story happens in Mark chapter 2, verse 18. And what happens in this story is the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, why don't your disciples fast? The disciples of the Pharisees fast. The disciples of John fast. Why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus is going to say to them, he's going to say, they can't fast when the bridegroom is here. Now, I'll be taken away, and on that day they will fast, but they cannot fast because I have come. Now, this causes a great stress because what Jesus is claiming here is that he has authority over tradition. You see, fasting had become the tradition. It had become the accepted way of of being a good believer. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Your traditions have no meaning right now because I have come. There is no reason to fast and long for the Messiah because I am here. This is the time of feasting. This is the time of rejoicing. I have authority over your traditions. They didn't love that. We wouldn't love that much either, would we? If someone came in and, and we said, oh, we, uh, we kneel for prayer. No, I have authority over your tradition. Mm. Um, we, at third service, we, we stay on our knees until Will has finished playing the response. We kind of look askance at those who get up too soon. I don't know if that was you. <laughs> those are our traditions. That's how we do it. Jesus says, I have authority over your traditions. But that's not the worst of it. It goes on. Another day, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field, and it happens to be the Sabbath. And the disciples are picking heads of grain, and they're threshing them in their hands, and they're eating the grain. And the Pharisees are saying to Jesus, why are your disciples doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? You see, this is the way authority works. Authority comes into our life and establishes guidelines. Now, that's a good thing because without guidelines, our lives are chaos. So let me give you an example of an authority that you like. When you get done here, you're going to get in your car and you're going to go out there on the road and you're going to drive along on the road and there's going to be this funny looking device that has three different color lights on it. Have you seen those? When it's green, what do you do? You go. When it's red, what do you do? When it's yellow, what do you do? Go faster. Yeah. I've seen you all. I know exactly what you do. Red, yellow, green. Now, we have all decided that the authority that established this is a righteous authority, and when it's red, we stop our car even when we're irritated. Occasionally, there's somebody who refuses to function according to the authority. And what do we hope happens to that guy that ran the light? I hope they catch him. Right? Because we need this structure. The authority comes and it gives us structure and it enables us to go. Now, is a red, yellow, and green light the only way traffic could be controlled? No, but it is the way we've agreed on Someone could potentially come along and come up with a different system, and we might agree to it eventually. But we would be angry for a while that they took away our traffic lights. That's how it works. So authority comes into our life and gives us structure. The Pharisees were establishers of authority. Authorities establish the rules and then make sure the rules are enforced. And within the religious community of Israel, the Pharisees had established the rules. And because Sabbath was important, they were trying to protect it. So they made rules to protect Sabbath. The problem is, once authorities start setting up rules, they tend to multiply until they become oppressive. And this is what had happened here. So they're walking through the field, and they're taking grain, and they're eating it. And they say, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Then Jesus tells an interesting story, and I'll let you you look at it. He tells the story about David when David went into the temple and ate the bread that was unlawful. We've talked about this before another time. But the part I want to draw your attention to here really starts in Mark 2, verse 27. And it says, and Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man 
and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, you've heard that term before, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, but I want you to appreciate it here, maybe in a way you haven't before. We talked about the word Lord. What does it mean? The Lord is the one who has authority. So if Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, the claim that Jesus is making right here is that I have authority over Sabbath. No, that's too much, right? I mean, he's claiming the authority to forgive sins. He's claiming authority over tradition. He's claiming now authority over Sabbath. They didn't like this. And this is what sets up the key story that we're going to look at today that starts in Mark chapter 3, verse 1. So we read, And Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Now, we talked about before how it's kind of a strange story to us that there was a man in the synagogue with a demon. Why would a man with a demon come to the synagogue? And and that is kind of strange for our understanding of things. And if, if something like that were to happen, we'd probably be pretty shook up by that, but we would, by God's grace, find a way to deal with that. But, but nonetheless, even beyond that, there are times when we come to the worship experience to the worship service with a darkness in us, uh, when we come in here with unforgiveness in our hearts. That's a darkness in us. When we, when we come in with a jealousy in our hearts, when we come in with anger in our spirit, this is a darkness that can come in with us. And I want to suggest to you that this is what has happened to the Pharisees this day because they have come to the service where there's a man with a withered hand, and so they're watching Jesus really closely in order to find a way to accuse him. Okay, here's a little heads up for you. If you ever come to church for the express, work, the express purpose of finding fault in someone so you can accuse them, you're missing the point. You're not doing it right. This is the gathering of the people we love. We don't come here to find fault with each other. We come here to find mercy for each other and for ourselves. And we come here to extend mercy to one another. So the Pharisees now, they're they're in the right place, but they don't have the right spirit. It's not enough to be in the right place. you got to be in the right place with the right spirit. So they're in there, and they're watching Jesus closely because they want to accuse him. Now Jesus knows what's going on. So verse 3, And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Now, Jesus didn't always do it that way. There's lots of stories where Jesus took someone aside and healed them over here and said, don't tell anybody what I did. But that's for a different reason when that happens. This time, there's a specific purpose. Jesus is going to make a point, and this point has to do with him being Lord of the Sabbath. And he says, stand right here. So the man stands in front of everyone. Verse 4 And Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. Okay, so so what's going on here? Jesus has brought this man right here to the middle, and then he throws out one of those questions. Remember last Sabbath, we talked about how Jesus will, will ask certain questions sometimes. And, and typically, what happens with the questions of Jesus is our mind knows the right answer, but we act the opposite way. That's, that's what's tricky about the questions Jesus puts to us, is because the way he asks the question, we know, obviously, it's better to do good on Sabbath than evil. Yet, the Pharisees are sitting in the room on Sabbath plotting evil but they're plotting evil in the name of lawfulness. It's quite a trap, isn't it? So he puts the man there. The man obviously needs help. Jesus is able to help him, and Jesus says to them, which is better, to do good or evil, to save a life or to kill? They don't answer. And then comes 
what is something I've been telling you about in the book of Mark. Mark, Mark will attribute to Jesus more emotion than most of the other Bible writers do. And he does that very strongly here in verse 5. It says, And when Jesus had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He's, he's attributing two emotions to Jesus in this moment. The emotion of anger, but why anger? He is angry because their hearts are hard, because they see a man who needs mercy, and all they want to do is accuse Jesus for helping him. And it grieves Jesus' heart that the people who claim to be God's people care more about the rules than about having mercy on a man who suffers. Do we ever get caught in that trap where we care more about lawfulness than we do about mercy? Verse 5, And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And everybody was excited, and they gathered together and praised God for the good work. I wish that's what the next verse said. But what the next verse actually says is, the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Life and death and lawfulness. So according to the behavior of the Pharisees, it's not okay to make a man whole on the Sabbath, but it is okay to plot how you're going to kill him. Is that law-keeping? See, this is what happens to us when we let lawfulness take the place of mercy, when we, when we become so enamored by our traditions and our processes that we will use the day set apart to receive the mercy of God, to make judgments on each other, and in fact plot against one another to speak evil on the day that God has set apart for good. All in the name of lawfulness. It's not okay to heal on the Sabbath, but it is appropriate to plot to kill. It's ugly what happens to us, isn't it? So a couple lessons we can take from this. The first one is kind of a big picture lesson. Kind of a big picture lesson here. It's interesting what the Pharisees do. So authorities set themselves up. And they make rules and they enforce rules. And as long as the rules are righteous, the people prosper under the righteous rule. But when the rules become evil or oppressive, the people suffer under the rules. God is authority and He has set up His laws so that we would prosper under His rules. But then we come along, and in order to protect those laws, stack our own traditions on top of them, and then we persecute one another over the traditions, completely losing sight of the laws. Invariably what happens when the church reaches a point, or the people reach a point, that, that their authority is no longer sufficient to bring compliance, throughout history this has been the case, the church will then turn to secular and civil authority to see that its rules are enforced. This is exactly what happens in this story. The Pharisees go to the Herodians. Who are the Herodians? They were a group that was in uh, cooperation and in connection with Herod the king. So because the Pharisees are seeing in Jesus that he's not respecting their authority, they're saying, we can't make this guy do what we want. So they turn to the secular authority and plot on how they can get rid of Jesus. Ultimately, this is going to be how they pull it off, right? They arrest Jesus, they take him in, they try him, and then where do they take him? They take him to the court of Rome. They take him to Pilate. And Pilate condemns him to death. 
So what I want to warn you with here, and I want to touch on Adventist history with this, is that it is always a temptation for the church in the name of lawfulness and in the name of righteousness to turn to civil authority to enforce its will. And this is why we as Adventists have always taken a very strong stand on the subject of religious liberty. Would it be awesome if everybody in America kept the Sabbath? That would be fabulous. Should we go to the local government and get them to make a law? No. The Sabbath is to be kept from a heart that is willing, not by coercion. So we are not to turn that way. When we are not winning the hearts of the people, we don't force them with external force. We go back and keep trying to win the hearts. That's how the kingdom of God works. So that's the first point I want to make, and I want to link that back. You see in here the impulse, he's not doing what I want, I'm going to get the police to go get him. Okay, that's, that's not what we're about. But that's just one lesson. Here's the lesson that hits home for each one of us. Jesus came to the Pharisees who had set up this structure, this system, and they were functional in it to a degree, but into that system had come a great deal of dysfunction. And Jesus challenged their traditions. And Jesus challenged their beliefs. And Jesus challenged their motives. Every believer... If you would be a true follower of Jesus, if Jesus is truly to be Lord of your life, you must let him challenge your assumptions, your traditions, your beliefs, and your motives. Because what happens to us, particularly when we want to be a good believer, we work really hard to figure out what the box of God's will looks like, right? And that box is made up of our background, our traditions, our expectations, uh, things that are right, but things we've imported into it that aren't. See, this is the great challenge of diversity. This is the great challenge of multiculturalism. This is the great challenge of intergenerationalism. We don't all have the same box, do we? And you put us together, and there's friction. And we tend to get into a power play, and we tend to look for authorities to come and say, make them do it our way. No, make them do it our way. And none of this brings us closer. So we can't let a tradition be our Lord. We can't let a, a list of doctrines be our Lord. We can't let culture be our Lord, Jesus must be our Lord. And if you want Jesus to be your Lord, you're going to need to spend time here reading this Word. Now, you're going to read stuff in here and you're going to be like, wow, I don't know what that's doing for me. But you just keep going because it's like, it's, it's, it's like water moving down a slope. It starts out and it looks like there's no impression at all. But the longer it goes, the more impression it makes and the deeper it goes and the more it forms a deeper channel in your life. And this is what Scripture does. It, it day by day forms that channel. You don't have one day where it all finally happens. But after 30 days, after 90 days, after 365 days, after 500 days, after a 1,000 days, the channel of the Word of God in your heart is deep. And when you confront the realities of life, you begin to confront them with a knowledge of what is in here. This is the voice of Jesus in your life. He becomes your Lord. But that's not the only thing. You don't just spend time here. you got to spend time here, too, on your knees. Listening for the Lord's voice. The scariest thing that ever happens in prayer is when the Lord actually talks back. We go before the Lord and ask for His leading, and then we're terrified anytime He actually leads in our life. 
It's scary to do this because by making him Lord of your life, you're saying, if there are things that I've held dear that are harmful to me, and you tell me they need to go, I I will let them go. That's hard. We don't want to do that. But that's what it means for Jesus to be Lord. We're going to sing a hymn here at the close. And it's really pretty mean of me. Actually, let's, let's blame Justin. He picked this one out. It's really mean of us to do this. Because when you sing these words, you are literally making a vow to the Lord. You see, the name of this song is, you've sung it before, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Remember that one? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Ah, That's a great little tune. Love to sing those words. Are you really saying it? Have you ever been yielded and still in your entire life? Are you are you moldable clay or are you clay full of suggestions? I don't know. I don't think a bull's right for me. I feel more like a pitcher. I don't know that you're doing that right. I, I... Have thine own way, Lord. We're going to sing this song. And, and here's, here's the tricky part about it. If you sing these words, this is your vow. Heaven is listening. We will not sing these words idly. If you don't mean this, sit this one out. Because it would better be better for you to not sing it than to sing it as a hypocrite. Have thine own way, Lord. Jesus has authority to call. Jesus has authority to teach. Jesus has authority over demons. Jesus has authority over disease. Jesus has authority over tradition. Jesus has authority over Sabbath. And by singing this song, you give Jesus authority over you. May God help us to make a faithful witness as we sing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, look upon us now and take the words of this song as our solemn vow to you today. Not that we will do it perfectly, but that we will acknowledge from this day forward, you are Lord of our lives. We are bought with a price. May we glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.